Good morning. This morning we are coming to you from the sound room here at Mike Family Worship Center. We'd like to welcome you, and if you're watching this morning by DVD, what you're about to see we hope will bless you and minister to your soul, body, and spirit. The family here at Mike Family Worship Center want you to know that we do not do these DVDs and send them into your home or even send them to the Philippines just because it's something more for us to do. But we do it because we feel like that through this outreach and through this ministry that God will speak to your heart. We realize that some of you are sick and at home and in the bed and can't get out to attend our services. We realize some of you have picked this up at the local stores, whether it be the Beauty Barn, Susie Q's, Mayaka Farm and Ranch, or whatever other outlet we have here in Micah City. Or maybe somebody just passed it along to you for whatever reason. Well, I want you to know that it's not by accident that you picked it up, nor by accident that someone gave it to you. Your Heavenly Father wants to speak to you today through this DVD. We now will take you in live to our services. We hope that you enjoy and the Spirit of God speaks to you. And in just a few minutes, we'll be back to pray with you today. Again, be blessed as we now enter into our service. How many of you have your trees? Everybody got your tree up yet? Okay. How many of you uh, uh, have decorated your house and it's all spotless and everything's in place? You got that done? Amen. Amen. How many of you spend hours on your tree making sure that the right ornament is in the right place at the right time? Anybody do that? Anybody that you do? Okay. Uh, true story. First Christmas in this house. Uh, we didn't have a Christmas tree. And uh, I had a man come up to me and said, uh, Pastor Lynn, he said, I have a tree that will fit perfectly back there in that corner where uh, the sound room is now. He said, and it is a beautiful tree. He said, and it is too big for my wife and I to put up anymore. And I would like to give it to you. And I said, well, we'd be more than happy to have it. So he comes bringing it up, and we get it assembled. And uh, Sister Judy has worked on it a time or two, and, and I think Nicole and some of you have seen it. That thing is probably about, what, five or six foot in diameter? Bigger than that, maybe eight foot in diameter, and goes all the way to the ceiling. Big tree. Um, we got the tree up, hadn't been decorated yet, and on that Sunday, uh, following that announcement, uh, his daughter walked in, looked at that tree, and said, um, my dad has a tree just like that, and I, he's going to give it to me to put into my house so I can have a tree just like that. I looked at her and I said, I hate to tell you that, that's your tree. <laughs> kind of created a little family strife. But it was okay. She enjoyed it. It was pretty. But where I'm going with this story is we had a lady in our fellowship at the time who told me, she said, um, we got together a decorating party, right? And how many of you know Pastor Lynn is very kid-friendly? Kids are going to participate. Kids are going to have a great time. It don't matter to me whether they make a mess or not. As long as we got kids, we got life. You know, uh, we got... If they're babies and they scream and they cry, well, that's okay. And I want to back up. The little, the little girl here that said, can you hear that singing? We need to pay attention. Because when you see little kids dancing or little kids, they're hearing something the adult here didn't hear. And she probably heard some angels singing. Just throw that in for you, okay? We probably should have paid a lot closer attention than what we did to what she said. But anyway, moving right along, uh, she began to come and help us decorate. Well, I knew that I needed to back out of the picture real quick like Donnie. When she looked at me and she said, Now, Pastor Lynn, that don't go there. It's a tree. <laughs> Put ornaments on it. Put it on where you want to. I said, oh, don't go there, huh? I said, so I backed out of the way. And the next thing you know, she was so particular, making sure that this red ornament lined up with this green ornament and this silver ornament, and I mean it just flowed in line and all this other kind of stuff. No exaggeration. Eight hours on that tree. And it looked just as pretty as that 15-minute job right there. <laughs> but that's me, okay? 
a lot of us strive to have the perfect Christmas scene, the perfect Christmas tree, the perfect decorations, the perfect dinner, everything all laid out. One of my greatest secular movies of all times that I love to watch every year is Chevy Chase's Christmas Vacation. Isn't that just the greatest movie? When you need a reality check, just turn on Chevy Chase, okay? You know how the movie starts out. He's in the car, taking the family in pursuit of the perfect Christmas tree, Brother Barney. And as he's driving down the road, this semi guy, and all of a sudden he's underneath the semi. You've watched the movie, right? Then they drive all this way to find the perfect Christmas tree, only to realize that he forgot a saw. That's me. And he gets the tree, and he gets there, and he gets home, and then he starts a light display. How many of you dads put up lights? How many of you dads put up lights under protest? Okay. I will tell you that for I will tell you for all of you let me make sure the audience is for all of you who uh, uh, came to laugh your way to a better marriage, if you put up lights you go to the happy place. So <laughs> that's all I gotta say about that. Give God honor, glory, and praise. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, clap your hands. Let's let's get some noise going in here. But anyway, as we, as I uh, see, I know I can identify with him as he's putting up lights. Uh, when we lived next door, the first Christmas we were back home, or maybe it was the second Christmas back home, my dad came over and we put lights up on the eve of the house. We put lights on the. Remember how we put lights around that oak tree? All the oak tree was all covered with lights. Man, you turned on it; it looked like an airport landing strip. I mean, we had so many lights out there. Okay. And uh, uh, we, Ashley could not understand in her little mind how one year we could cover the tree with lights and the next year the lights wouldn't go all the way around it. You know, because it had grown in process and we just had to keep adding lights. But I also can identify with that uh, when we moved over to um, Klein Road uh, because we were off the road, in my logical mind, there's no need to put up lights. Who's going to see them anyway? You know, why go to all the trouble? Forget it. Not mama. You put up lights, Singletary, you won't put up lights here. Okay. We put lights on the eaves. We put lights on the doors. We put lights on the fences. We plugged them in. There was lights everywhere. She was so happy. She was excited. The perfect light display had just been made on Klein Road. Until about 20 minutes when the breaker started heating up and the electricity started flowing and... <laughs> out went the light display. Any of that happen to any of you guys? Oh, come on. It's okay. We're all, we all want the perfect Christmas. The perfect light display. The perfect tree. The perfect family dinner. Well, the other thing about the Christmas vacation is this. Remember how he's trying to get all of his aunts and uncles together for the perfect Christmas dinner? The perfect menu. The perfect this. The perfect that. Everybody trying to have the perfect Christmas dinner. Uh, I'm going to give you a fatherly suggestion right now. Give up on being perfect. Christmas is not about perfection. Christmas is about enjoying the birth of Jesus Christ and family and friends and having a great time. We have become a people of a society that is so consumer driven that we've got to have the perfect gift. We've got to have the perfect up to date toy. How many of you parents will be honest and say that your children asked for a Tonka fire truck this Christmas? Did he really? Amazing. Awesome. They didn't know they made him even right. How many of you have, have had requests for iPods, iPads, uh, DS's? Uh, have you had those? Laptops, okay, okay. Uh, or a flat screen TV? Anybody ever been asked for those? Sure. Okay. And how much more? Does an iPad, iPod, laptop, computer, um, DS's, and flat screen TVs cost more than a Tonka truck? I can remember, and I've told you this story every Christmas, I think, since I've been in pastoring here. The best Christmas I can remember in my life at home with my mom and dad. I got one gift underneath the Christmas tree. 
But I knew that one gift took everything they had saved to make happen for me. And that one gift was a Hereford brand roping saddle. But I want you to know, I enjoyed that gift more, Donnie, than any other gift I think I've ever received in my life. I thought I was little Joe Cartwright that morning <laughs> as I began to saddle my horse and ride. It is not perfection gifts. And maybe sometimes we begin to think it's wrong. It's not the quantity. It's not even the gifts. But we have become so consumer focused and driven. And the TV set is great with it. And all the ads trying to tell you what your kids need. And we're trying to keep up with the Joneses. And sometimes it's just impossible. Or how many of us fondly remember the Victorian Christmas traditions of the past? When we begin to look and see about all the things, of all the memories, how Christmas long ago should be. And we want that perfect Christmas day with family and friends gathered around the table and the perfect meal with no hitches and no get-ups. How many of you have been in the kitchen on Christmas Day? How many of you have been slavy in a way while your husband is in the chair with a remote control and you knowing that he could come and help you if he would and you're not going to ask him because he ought to have enough sense to know you need help in the kitchen so why don't he get up and come on in here and help me? <laughs> and how many of you men have got to the point that it's Christmas! I'm going to enjoy the day! I am king of the throne! I'm going to sit right here with my remote control and my recliner chair and don't she know that she's supposed to serve me on Christmas. Huh? Oh, come on, guys. Yeah, come on, where it is. Huh? Oh, I love to cook. That is the problem a lot of times in my house. You have three cooks. Look at us. Cashley loves to cook. Kathy loves to cook. I love to cook. My greatest sacrifice is getting out of the way and letting them do it. Because I want to tell them how to do it. And they already know how. But as we begin to look at the perfect Christmas, and as we begin to go down the list, we have become, we have concepts in our mind that are brought about, about the media and about different things, and we want to have a perfect Christmas. And we have replaced a consumer-focused Victorian-type Christmas with a true biblical meaning of a Christmas, which is God with us. God's with us. The biblical meaning of Christmas is God with us. We try to make a magical Christmas with sometimes false expectations and far out realities that will never happen. We put a, a, a realist, we put a, an expectation on Christmas that can never take place. And we put expectations in our life that we know when we begin to face reality that we will, we will not happen. We spend weeks and months planning for the perfect Christmas only to have your perfect Christmas dream shattered by imperfect family members. How many of you have planned for that great day? The roast is in the oven, the potatoes are peeled, and everything's going. And then all of a sudden, because of issues that arise in life, your dinner dreams are shattered and you just want to throw it all away and say, forget it. Why did I even get all my hopes and dreams up for? Truly, Truly, the realities of Christmas. Can, when you and I begin to look at this, I really want to tell you that you will not find perfection of Christmas in what you do or in what you planned, but you will find the perfect perfection of Christmas in the Lord Jesus Christ and what He came to do upon this earth, and that is to save the lost and to bring life to you and I. And when you begin to enjoy the real reason for the season, that is the birth of Jesus Christ, which means Emmanuel, which his name is called Emmanuel, which means God with you. The greatest gift you've ever wanted is right here with you. And his name is Jesus Christ. Donnie will never leave you nor forsake you. And Brother David, he will go through you and nobody else will go. And he come to this life and this earth to begin to bring you true hope. And that is what's lacking so many times. 
There are more suicides this time of year than any other time. There is more real pain experienced at this time of year than in the entire year. And I sometimes begin to wonder why that is. And as I begin to do some research for this message today, I found that uh, psychologists, counselors, and Brother Jim and Sister Marlene can verify this, as well as other theologians that are far more uh, educated than I am, that the reason is we set false expectations, we have uh, unrealistic dreams, and we are remember, sometimes we relive and remember the hurtful things of the past that we bring into today. And a lot of times in our Christian faith, we forget that all the condemnation and all the guilt of our past, when we fall in love with Jesus Christ, is done away with. He remembers it against us no more. He holds us against us no more. So if He doesn't hold hold it against us, then why should we want to keep reliving that of the past all the time? All the guilt and all the condemnation. It is under the blood. Let it go. And don't set false hopes and false expectations. When you and I begin to look at Christmas and the true Christmas story, the reality is that Christmas long ago really began with true life experiences. Turn in your Bibles, will, to Luke, please, to Luke's first gospel. And let us read. Starting at verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of reading this was. And then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Highest will overshadow you. And therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In our American Western culture, we have sanitized and cleaned up the Christmas story. Your Christmas cards that you have got or you are sending portrays the nativity scene, which is a a picturesque setting with a manger and cattle and sheep blowing in the fields or maybe a winter wonderland of snow and trees and all of that other stuff. About three years ago, I was able to go uh, to Indiana for the first time, the 1st of December, and saw snow for the first time in my life. I remember with anticipation, Brother David, as the plane landed, and I was very blessed that a family paid for my way to go out there so that I could just see snow as well as attend the men's conference at Whitehorse. And as we landed the plane, I looked out the window, Nicole, and there was snow on the runway. And as I I looked and I saw flurries coming down, and I said, wow, this is great. Man, I'm going to get to see snow, and it's going to be fun. And I remember getting off of the plane and walking and touching it and feeling it and seeing just how it was. I remember uh, going on our way. We rented a car and went from there to the motel. And I remember being there in August and seeing these great big evergreen Christmas trees. And as I saw those trees again, Nicole, they weren't brown and the leaves weren't off of them, but they still had the green leaves. And Brother Barney tucked in the leaves of those trees with snow as it had filled. And as I looked back and I began to see, oh, this was the picture of Christmas. Oh, Brother brother uh, David, it was like I had longed to see uh, trees with snow and pretty and 
in white. It didn't take long as I walked to Walmart that I saw snow, black, ugly, and messy. I began to slip on ice and did not know how. I remember going out to get in the car the next morning, and I wondered why in the rental car they had placed this little widget thing. I realized it didn't take me long to figure out. It was to shave the ice off the windshield, okay? My picturesque beauty of a dream uh, turned into a farce reality that it was all not pretty once it's there a while. And then I remember beginning to get up on Sunday morning and make my way to the church service before we left. And I began to walk through all of that mess and I began to see that it was not pretty as it was piled upon curves where people had trashed it and it began to melt with mud and all around it. My pretty white snow was in farce reality a mess and was making a mess and causing a mess. I remember as we walked into the foyer of the church that normally is so pretty and kept and clean, they were there with mops and began to mop up the wetness and get the salt and all that stuff that they had to do to contend with the snow. I remember seeing uh, the, the associate pastor on Sunday morning uh, as I looked out my motel window as he made those rounds dragging this uh, on this um, uh, lawnmower, dragging behind him this cart. It looked like it was fertilized spreading. And when I asked him, he was spreading salt all over so that the ice, people wouldn't slip and fall and so forth. And I said, man, that's a lot of work for something so beautiful. I remember leaving there and heading back toward Indianapolis and passing semi after semi and that as the wind, as the moisture in the snow began to crystallize, icicles were hanging on the air vents of the truck as the wind made its way by the mirrors and so forth. And when I hit sunshiny Florida that Sunday afternoon, I kissed the ground and said, I saw snow, thank God, but I don't care to go back. <laughs> Because my reality had turned to reality, my fantasy had turned into reality. And a lot of times in life, that's what happens to us. We fantasize our reality until it really happens, and then we forget this picturesque picture that never happens. We live in a real world. We live in real situations and real trouble. And I want to submit to you today, and what little time that I have left, that the Christmas so long ago was not a picturesque setting. It was not one of snow-capped mountains and of a calm manger scene, of a stable as we know them. But it was a cave filled with animals. If you've ever been to Israel, you will know. It was, had animals inside there. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you know where there's animals, there's other stuff? The parade route figured that 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 was that was thought out real clear yesterday. How many of you that walked the parade route yesterday had to dodge the droppings of those horses? The gifts left on the road. How many of you parents have 4-H projects? And isn't it amazing that you never have to tell your, your son or daughter to go out and clean up the stall because the stall's always perfect, right? How many of you complain about having to shovel loads of cow manure? Bring in sand to absorb the wetness of the urine. So I'm here to tell you today, the manger scene was not a pretty one. Because I also saw this yesterday along the parade route. Where there's gift from horses, there are flies. And as animal dung laid in the stable, there were no doubt flies and gnats flying around our baby Jesus and his mom and dad. We have sanitized it with a picture of, of heavenly angels and all of those things. And it is okay. And we have sanitized it because we know the end of the story. But it is very real. The Christmas story is messy. It's hard sometimes to comprehend. And so is your life. If you'll be honest with yourself, your life's not perfect. You always, you've got dreams and aspirations. You would wish your life was, per, was different. All of us wish that we didn't have to go through some of the things in life we went through. But we can't help what life brings us. We can only change what we can do about it and hope that we don't go make the same mistakes again. Every parent has made this statement to his child. 
I don't want you to make the same mistakes I have made. I don't want you to go through what I went through. And in doing so, we try to give them a better life. When How do we know what's really best for life? Because you see, it's all in the mess of life that God is able to show Himself so real and so perfect to you and I. We believe if we follow Jesus, that life will be perfect. And it will never get messy. How many of you have been made this promise when you gave your heart and life to God? Oh, now that you're giving your life to God, things are going to be great in your life. You're going to have it rosier and better, and you're going to see God's power, and you're never going to have a problem again. But if you do, you're going to be able to just walk right on through it. Never get, never get beside yourself. I was told that lie from the pits of hell. But life is really just going to, life is just really going to get messy because, see, as long as you were in the world, the devil didn't need to chase you. He didn't need to make things rough on you. But now that you're serving God, you're warning between two masters for your soul. You're warning between the enemy who wants to take you to hell, and you're warning, the ma- warning between the master who wants to give you life and give you life abundantly. We live in a real thing called life. And life ain't pretty. And if all you had to worry about was yourself, Sister Sue, then your life would be perfect. But you decided to bring into your life a husband, David, and then y'all decided to bring in a daughter, Felicia, and she decided to bring in two grandkids with a bunch of stuff, and guess what? If they would just get it all together, Sister Sue, life would be perfect. Really. If Kathy would just be perfect, our life would be good. But you see, life is filled with, one, with a lot of unexpectancies. And so was that very first Christmas. Oh, look. Oh. So today I want us to look at Luke for the few minutes we have left. I want us to look at the first chapter of Luke. And I want to see what we can learn from the Christmas story so that we will not have false expectations when it comes to this Christmas. Lesson number one. Look at verse 30. Then the, angel of the, then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. From Mary we can learn, and from the Christmas story we can learn, that life sometimes brings fear. Sometimes as you walk with God, you will encounter fear in your life. At some point you will run head on into fear. Look what the angel said to Mary. Do not be afraid. Can you imagine what Mary must have felt? Here she is, all alone, and all of a sudden this angelic being appears to her. And I don't want you to know, I've never really seen an angel, but if I was to see one, my eyes would probably get big, my hair would probably stand up on my head, and I'd probably say, Oh Lord, what's happening in my life? Can you imagine? And then all of a sudden, this angelic being says, Mary, don't be afraid. Who are you kidding? I'm scared to death. <laughs> we cannot get that. We can. We cannot deny that life brings fear, and we cannot deny that Mary had said had had some sense of fear, or the angel would have not have told her, "Don't be afraid." Life brings fear. Huh. Ooh. Praise God! Cindy whipped her. Her fear factor. But I know how paralyzing it was for us when we found out her diagnosis. How many, how much how must she have felt? How many of us face real fear every day? Life brings fear. How was she going to explain to her family that her, a teenage girl fixing to be married, betrothed to a man, is a child? How is she going to explain to Joseph her intended that she's pregnant when he had never been with her? How was she going to face society and all of the things society had and all the labels they would put on her? How is she going to face this? <laughs> she was pondering all of those things. When you read Matthew 1, 18 and 19, you will find out that after she told Joseph, he rejected her. He didn't want anything to do with her and he began to make plans to, to secretly break the contract of the marriage covenant. She was rejected. How many of you face rejection every day? 
Christmas season is not perfect. But the gift of the true Christmas is. And his name is Jesus. It is easy to portray the Christmas story as a magical event because we know how it ends. You and I do not know how our story will end. We do not know the end of our life. But I am here to tell you this today. The author of your finisher and your faith is just that. He began your life even before you were consumed in your, or either conceived in your mama's womb. He knows the days, the psalmist says, He knows you every day that you have in your life. And if you trust Him with your eternal salvation and your eternal security, then why can't we trust Him with everyday life? Why can't we give Him everything we are, everything we have and say, God, I don't know where you're taking me, but I'm going to follow you. I don't know where this road's going to lead, but I trust you. I don't know what kind of mess you're going to have to, I'm going to have to go through. But listen to this, and I can assure you of this, when you get into a mess, that is a breathing down for God's miracles in your life. Miracles are created in mess and mystery. Look at the Christmas story of the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ was brought about with the mystery of a teenage girl getting pregnant, miraculous conception, and us needing a Savior for this world. Oh, today, I want to inspire you to say this. I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know what's going on in your world and I don't know what's troubling you this morning. And your life may be a tangled web of mess. Your life may be a tangled web of knots. Your life may be, and it seems like that every time you take a step forward, you get knocked three steps back. Ever been there? It may seem like that every time you begin to find a little happiness, that sadness comes into your life. You may seem like you have no hope. You may seem like that you're in the darkest place and the darkest hour that you've ever been. But I'm here to tell you today, hold on to your hat, grab your bootstraps and hang on. Your miracle is on the way. It is dark as just before dawn and joy cometh in the morning. And if you'll just hang on to what God's got in store for your life, you're about to make the best run you've ever had in your life. Because our imaginations of Christmas may not be perfect. But the true reason for the Christmas season is and his name is Jesus. Let us look at let's look at one let us look at Luke one and twenty eight. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you, and blessed are you among women. You have found favor and you are a favored one of God today. And you can hang on to that. The whole Christmas story and all the Gospels can be summed up in these two verses. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. In Revelation 3 and 20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Not only did God come to save you and to redeem you, but he came to be so real to you that he's standing right here, Violet. He's right here going, Let me in! Why are you trying to be in control? Why are you trying to make things happen? I'm here. Let me in. I want to make a difference in your life. Let me in. And in our mentality, we stand there going, you wait, I really make a mess out of it. I'm going to show you how to fix this. How many of you have ever cleaned up messes after your kids? All the time, right? But how many of you try to teach your kid to clean up after themselves? And you see a little mess, and you tell them to go clean it up. And by the time they get through trying to clean it up, they really got a mess you got to clean up. That's the way we are in our life. Oh, I have made messes after mess after mess after mess. And if I had just tried to clean it up when it was little, it would be okay. 
But the more I try to fix it, the messier it gets. But God wants to fix your mess today. Number two, you are favored, but you're not perfect. Look at your neighbor and say, and you can do this. It's okay. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not perfect. And you can look at him and say, neither are you. You're not perfect and neither are you. We got junk, guys. We got stuff in our life. None of us are perfect. We make mistakes every day. Miss Kathy is the best thing that ever happened to me. Her brown eyed beauty. She is a great friend. She is a great helpmate. She is a great person. She consoles me. She loves me through all of my mess. She understands me. Okay? And as good as she is, she still has some flaws, believe it or not. I'm going to make an appointment with Brother Jim as soon as this airs. <laughs> but listen, none of us are perfect. We all got stuff. And we need to realize we're not perfect. But how many of us try to make somebody else perfect? Oh, someone that I know, not saying who, always says, if you would just listen to me, you wouldn't be in this mess. <laughs> I told you if you would do that, it's going to happen. Why didn't you listen to me? Anybody ever hear that? How many of us though, how many of us though, we try to fix what's wrong with people? Never considering that it might be wrong with us. If I can fix me, then I don't need to worry about anybody else. <coughs> Kathy Howell is not responsible for my happiness. And she cannot make me happy. Only Lynn Howell can make me happy. And what I do, and my, most of all, my relationship with Jesus Christ. So can I ask for a favor this Christmas season? For all of you... Um, Codependence for all of you who have got it all together, okay? Would you just quit trying to fix somebody else and worry about yourself? Because you can't fix them. And I'm going to give you another insight that you already know, and now that I'm in the doghouse, I'm just going to keep digging the hole deeper, okay? Okay? They don't want you to fix them, they just want to be left alone. Because we need to realize that I cannot fix me and Kathy cannot fix me or can you fix anybody else. It is only a heart transformation when you fall in love with Jesus Christ that you can be changed. Because we can gussy up the outside but we can still be ugly on the inside. I remember one time <clears throat> this grandfather was uh, sitting in the living room and his teenage daughter come in and she began to sit down in front of him and she began to take out these little containers and smear them all over her face. And he looked at her and he said, Baby, what you doing? She said, I'm putting on makeup. He said, Oh. After she got it all put on, all her lips just right and the eyes done, after hours worth of working on the face, it would get all just right and all done. She looked at Grandpa and she said, Well, Papa, what do you think? He said, well, he said, in all my years, I still, I still have to rely on this fact, baby. No matter how many coats of paint you still put on the barn, you still ever see of a cracking crevice. <laughs> Ladies, don't stop wearing makeup. You need, not you need to, but, <laughs> boy, I think that will be better. Don't stop putting on makeup. Makeup adds to the beauty of your God, God made. Let me put it to you that way. And I must tell you, when Kathy spends her time getting gussied up for me, I love it. Okay? It is okay. But what I really went, meant before I really dug the hole deep was to tell you that no matter what you put on the outside, it is really how you are on the inside that will eventually come out. Because the scriptures tell you that as a man is in his heart, so does his mind thinketh. And where a man's heart is, there his treasure is also. What is important to you today? You are favored, but you are not perfect. We are not perfect. You are favored. God, God's favor cannot be earned. God comes 
when you are doing everything wrong. How many of you just feel like you can't do nothing right? Everything's wrong in your life. God comes when you're doing everything right, when things are right in your life. And God comes, believe it or not, as that old song goes, even when you're naughty or nice, God still comes to you because He loved you. He gave His life for you and He wants to be a part of your life today. God loves you and He wants to be a part of your life. We as Christians encounter troubles and persecution. That's life. Especially if you follow Jesus. Turn to 2 Corinthians for a moment. And listen to what the Apostle Paul had to say about his life. 2 Corinthians 11, chapter, verses 24 through 27. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods... Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day. I have been in the deep. In journeys often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In weariness and toll, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things which come upon me daily. Now, we're talking about the Apostle Paul, the man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, a man who was literally changed on the road to Damascus. Look what he encountered in life, all for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet, if we stump our toe on the church chair, we get offended. They should have had that chair there. Now, that's an extreme. But how many times do we, someone says something to us and we take it the wrong way? Or we get a look that we're just not satisfied with and we want to run. It ain't about you, Robin. And I love you. Brother Frank, I'm glad you're back. I've been missing you, sorry. Hi. I'm glad you're home. I want to learn from you. I love you, okay? But it ain't even about Brother Frank. It ain't about any of us. All my family is back in the back. Nicole, I love you, baby, like you're my own daughter. And you know that. I love your children. I love my grandkids. I love all of you with a love that you just can't explain. But guess what? It ain't about you either. It is not about the difficulties of life. Because in the difficulties of life, that's where we see the miracles of God happen. It is in the persecutions of life that we see the mighty hands of God. Brother David, it is when you do not have work tomorrow that you see the favor of God coming into your life with a job. It is when all of us are sitting, how are we going to make ends meet? That we get a miraculous offering in the mail. Or we get a blessing that we come unexpected. That we see the handiwork of God. If life was perfect, we'd never be able to see the handiwork of God. But because life's a mess, because life is hard, because life ain't easy, we get to see God do miraculous things in our life. And it is time we quit molly grubbing about the bad things and start rejoicing in them. Because in all things, He works together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm called. Give Him glory and honor. Two black eyes. We get too starchy. I love it this time of year. We get in our traditions. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Oh, holy night. We sing it with so dryness and feeling, left no feelings. It stenched his nostril. Because we get so caught up on trying to buy the perfect gifts that we forget that we need to be wise men and women at this time of year. And we need to come and worship the Christ child. It's not about what gifts you bear. It's not about how big your gift. But it is about coming to Him what you have and giving it to Him. You say, well, Pastor Lynn, I ain't got nothing. Then bring Him your nothing and watch Him do a miracle because He can take nothing and create something out of it if you love Him and you trust Him today. Give Him God honor, glory, and praise. Look what happened when Jesus was born. 
We have this picturesque setting, and we're fixing to have it here next week, of a manger scene. And yesterday on the float, we had Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus, and Cheyenne is the angel of the Lord standing above them, and, and we had everybody honoring and bowing down to Him, and all of that kind of good stuff. Okay? And then we put it as, oh, wasn't this a great time of year? But did you know when Jesus came to His earth, Herod killed babies underneath the two for fear that He would take His throne? Now I want you to know, Him coming to this earth caused some trouble in paradise. What would you have done as a mom if you knew some, some baby had been born somewhere and all of a sudden the king's men come into your house, took your male baby out, and began to cut his head off? What would you think? Would you be singing, Oh come, oh come, Emmanuel? Or would you be saying, God, you got to get here. you got to straighten out this mess. Things ain't always pretty in life. Things come with some prices sometimes. Some trouble. The third thing in closing. God comes among your pain. God comes among your confusion. And God comes among all of your insecurities in your life. Because that's how He makes Himself real. That's how you know He cares about you. That's how you know He loves you. Brother Ken, if you never had a problem, you wouldn't know He could solve it. Sister Sue, if you ever had a dark, never had a dark night, you wouldn't know He could bring you hope. Brother Barney, if you never had a financial need, you would never know he could supply one. Mama Bert, if you never needed new tires, you'd never know that he could supply them for you. If your children had never messed up, you would have never known that God can take something out of the mess of their life and make nothing good of it. I have not been a perfect dad and nor have I never been a perfect pastor. But my prayer has always been, Brother Dave, that in my learning I do not cause someone else to stumble or hurt someone along the way as I learn. If I had went to Bible college, if I had went to theology school, I do not believe that there's a course that would, that would, that would help you learn how to pastor. Because you can only learn that through experience. And I can honestly tell you that pastoring this church is different than pastoring the Methodist church or the Baptist church or even a church like this in town. Because guess what? What makes up a church? You do. And you guys ain't going to be at another church. Because you're right here with me. And I love all of you. And you guys are great to pastor. But it is in our time of deep despair. And it's in a time of greatest pain that God sweeps down with His infinite grace and mercy and says, I want to show you just who I really am. It is in my time when not knowing what else to do that He opens up the windows of heaven and begins to minister through my pain. And you know the other thing that God does? He puts people in your life. Sometimes you wonder why. <laughs> Just teasing. But He puts people in your life. People who can love you and bless you. People who you can bless in different ways. He did the same for Mary. Look in Luke, I just read to you what happened. You have a cousin. And she has conceived a son in her old age. Go see her. She can understand. How many of you have ever walked through a trouble or a trial and at the time you're going through it you just don't understand why God allowed this to happen to you? Have you ever been to a place in your life where, man, God, why did this happen? I don't understand this. And maybe six months, maybe two years, Maybe even a decade later, 
you run into somebody facing the same thing you faced. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit begins to bring into you stuff. And you minister to that family. Or you minister to that person. And you would not have been able to minister to them unless you had walked that road and been through that experience. He brings people into your life. This Christmas season, it's not about being perfect. But it is about allowing God to be who He is and facing the realities of Christmas. Donnie, will you take push the other side of the way, buddy? As Kathy and I began to, and maybe you, may begin to go through this Christmas season this year, we will face this, the, excuse me a moment, please. We will face the realities of that we are not able to financially do what needs to be done in our family's lives to make them have a perfect Christmas. There are situations, and you know them, that Kathy and I just don't have the money to fix, or we'd fix them. There are things that Ashley needs. She's got, no, don't get this wrong. She's taken care of. She has everything she needs, so Nanny, don't, don't try to fix it. It's okay. But there are wish lists that she has that we just can't take care of anymore. As I look back over Roy, as I look back over 2D Head Fred and Chandler's Christmas lift, thank God he wanted pillows and they were on sale from J.C. Penney for three eighty eight. You know what I mean? We can make pillows happen. But as I look at her wish list, I, I, I sit back in awe. And Sister Judy, I can't keep up with a consumer-focused Christmas about all the iPods and the iPads and stuff. I just can't do it this year. So as I sat back and I began to look and say, okay... So now, what is really the true meaning of Christmas? And remember last Sunday when we talked about it not being our birthday anyway? So why should we expect Christmas gifts and why should we expect presents? Because it's not our birthday, it's His birthday. And we talked about what we can bring to Him, and that's ourself. And once we bring ourself to Him, then He can do something with that. And today we're talking about the perfection of Christmas and what we can do to be perfect. So I thought all week long, and I thought about yesterday as... I was being chauffeured on the golf cart during the parade route and I was throwing out brand new Beanie Babies that were given to us and I was watching Hannah hand out candy and I was fussing out Kathy because she wasn't moving fast enough and talking to so many people and, and she was doing it because of my knee was bothering me and all of that stuff and I remember as we worked here yesterday on the float trying to make it just so and relieve Sister Diane's stress. I'll tell you what buddy, she gets stressed out over stuff. She just got to roll with the float. But anyway, with all that being said, I thought to myself... What could be the truest Christmas gift, the most perfect Christmas gift that I could give to my family? Been thinking about that for weeks. And then as I drove that golf cart, as I seen the kids, as they hollered for toys and they hollered for candy, I said, what could it be the greatest gift from gift I could give my community? What could I give them that they would really receive the greatest Christmas gift. What does my community really need? Oh, then I begin in my mind to go do everything I think my actor needs and realize that I can't make it happen, Sister Veronica. I'm not financially able to do it. And as I'm turning off the parade route and I'm being chauffeured on my golf cart and we stop and as people begin to disassemble the float to make my work week easier next week and as they all begin to work around I begin to realize Brother Charles that I have been given the perfect gift me I have a God who loves me that died and gave his best son for me I have a church family who's willing to gather around and work to make my dreams become reality. So what can I give them? What can I give you? What can I give my family? What can I give Ashley and Brettley and David and Carly and Jan and Jimmy and the kids? What can I give them? What can I give Kathy 
that will know Sister Vicky without a shadow of a doubt that when I look deep into her brown eyes, she knows I love her. What can I give you, my church family, that know this out of shape, soon to be thin man loves you? What can I give this community? This morning, I had to be here early for reasons that don't really matter. And as I pulled up in the yard and I saw the float out back and I saw the church and I come in and begin to open it up and make arrangements for today's service. I heard the Spirit of the Lord says, Give them me. It's, it's, it's not your birthday. Silver and gold will all perish away. But my love will endure for a lifetime. Give them me. So then how do we give Jesus? <laughs> Robin, Violet, and Nicole, come up here please. Donnie, I'll need you in a minute. Make a line. Just, uh, yeah, face me. Face me. You'll have to line up side by side. Nicole, if you'll come over here. Would you please lock arms together? They're beautiful, aren't they? But these are messes in my life. This is my life. All made up of messes. Now I tried to wade through my mess alone. And I just can't get through the mess. I get held back. Oh, mess looks nice. It looks pretty. Look at the mess. That ain't too bad. If you like messes, look at that pretty red hair. She's my favorite redhead. Look how pretty she is. She's still a mess. Huh. Best gift in the church a pastor could be given. But it's still a mess. It's all a mess. So how do I get through my messes? How do we get through our messes in life? Well, I get me a good friend. Come on. We may not all... No, we're not going to knock you down. It's okay. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. No. This is entirely different than before. You're okay. Okay? Now, friends... All them times y'all laugh. Okay. Now listen. Friends are... Uh, and, and, and relationships are a little... A little um, Bewildering at times, okay? Because each person in your life, each friend in your life has something that God made them with that is not like yours. He made them with a personality and a different set of, what do you call it when you think a lot? Um, anyway, with a whole new mindset, a way of thinking, okay? I mean, Shoot. Everybody just thinks different. Everybody has different personalities. Everybody's wired different, you know? If you'd come to laugh your way to a better marriage, you'd see you women are all over the map. <laughs> Us men are methodical. We're in our box. And don't take me out. Okay? Very simple. That's right. So so all of us are some of us are complex. Others of us are very simple, very easy to read. But you still have to have friends. Mary had to have a mentor. He sent her to her cousin who knew what she was dealing with. There are things we, so we get our friend and we try to get through our mess but we still can't get through our mess. Friends can help us see the other side of the mess but the mess is still there. So how do we get through the mess? Because our Savior came to this earth. He was crucified for our sins. And now he's at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and I, Brother Barney. Doing what he was required to do. But listen to what he says in John 16, I believe it is. He says, It is expedient that I go away. Because if I go away, I will send one that will be a comforter to you, a teacher to you, and will empower with you. And I won't leave you alone. I won't leave you fatherless. But, I'll, but you'll have a comforter. So, come here, Brother Ken. Okay, All right. So now, I still got my mess. 
I still got my friend who's praying with me, who's trying to help me. But now I've accepted Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And I got the comforter. My mess is still here. I can see what's on the other side of my mess. All right, come on, don't leave me. Now we're just going to walk through our mess to the other side. So this Christmas season, thank you all may be seated. So Pastor Lynn, why do you summed up in the last 45 minutes as this. The greatest Christmas gift you could ever have is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And have Him turn your mess over to Him and watch what happens. And quit trying to have the perfect Christmas. Put up the lights and if the breakers blow, ah, so well they're up. If you fix the greatest Christmas dinner and Uncle Harold comes in drunk or fussing, let him fuss. Or if you invite him to Christmas dinner and he lets your Shetland pony go, ah, just a pony anyway. True story, by the way. I have to tell you about that sometime. <laughs> it's just stuff. Because the true meaning of Christmas is what Christ did on the cross of Calvary for you and I. And that was He came to this earth for the remissions of sins so that you and I could have a home eternal. Amen? Stand to your feet, look at your neighbor and say, I will, I will be, Christ be Christ to someone, to someone. This, week. this week. This Christmas, this Christmas. I, will I will give, give. The, gift the gift of love, of love. To, someone to someone in need. In, need. in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for all your blessings to us. Father God, we ask that you bless each and every one who are here today. And Lord, as we leave and go on our perspective voice, Father God, we ask that you just begin to open up the windows of heaven and you begin to pour out blessings on these families. We love you, God, and we thank you for what you're about to do in this house, we pray. And all who agreed said, Amen and Amen of the house of God. Good morning. We hope that you have truly been blessed by the DVD that you just watched. We have enjoyed bringing it to you. And uh, Brother Bob from Florida Video Productions and others help us make this possible. And we just appreciate their kindness and their efforts to do so. But it is not about a person or an organization or a company. But it is about the Spirit of God that you feel in your heart right now. I want you to know that if you're sick or broken hearted or if you need a friend, give us a call. You can reach us at 322-1691 or just look for us or you can email us at pastorjlynn at gmail.com. But we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear that these DVDs are touching your lives. But it's not so much about communication with each other as it is about communicating with Him, our Heavenly Father.